the presentations with a topic about something I don't understand anything about are always going to be like the most important ones and the most interesting ones. Alejandro will present something about EEG, or commonly known as electroencephalography, in a non-invasive method for the recording and the study of electrical activity of the brain taken from the scalp. Now, in other words, brain signals are used in many uh, different other ways, many other ways, like in research and entertainment purposes, such as neurofeedback, arts and neurogaming. But nowadays, this technology is being adopted more and more in different and uh, different industries. Now, Alejandro will de demonstrate a couple of demos, and the first approach to demonstrate is that EEG technologies are prone to common network and application attacks. So, let's give a very, very, very warm welcome to Alejandro. There you go. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here, for your time, for staying until the end. I know that many of you have had some beers or had dinner. And I know that some oxygen from your brain is going to your stomach now, so please save some of that oxygen for here. And well, this presentation, uh, I had the chance to uh, show this stuff in DEF CON this year, two months ago in Las Vegas. So I hope you like it. Uh, about me, um, I'm a consultant from the security company IOActive. We do different uh, kind of consulting services and research. Uh, I'm an enthusiast on fossing and programming. On fossing, I have developed some tools uh, like dot dot pwn for directory traversal uh, attacks with some other friend friends. Uh, also, I develop another fuser, fusing tool that I presented in Black Hat Arsenal last year for L file format fuzzing. Um I have a computer systems engineer background. I didn't study any neuroscience for uh, to do this research. So. Uh, this is a new topic for me. I've been doing this for the last year from scratch, but I think I understand a little bit of this because the, the human brain is very complex and the technology is very interesting. And I'm from this beautiful country, <laughs> Mexico. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about why this research. You might ask why brain stuff, why EEG, why is important, what's that? And I'm going, I will show you, show you the basic stuff about that, the, the neuroscience 101, as well as the insecurity aspects. This is why we are here. Why this technology is insecure for me so far. I'll sh show you some, some demos. Um, if you saw this movie, Johnny Mnemonic, it's a 90s movie. It's about uh, Keanu Reeves using his brain as a storage device. So if you're expecting this, this is not the, the talk you're looking for. But I can tell you the reason of this talk. Basically, we, uh, we take care about nowadays about information security, uh, mobile security, uh, um, car security, and all that stuff. What about our bodies? What about the information, the data that our bodies uh, emit? In the end of, of it is its data. So this technology, EEG, is being adopted more and more. Originally, it, became, it, uh, it uh, began in the medical industry. But nowadays, many, many research are being adopting more and more. And this, for me, is very important because 10 years ago, um, industrial networks, SCADA networks, nobody was talking about security about that. All the people was just worried about that it works. The computers are connected to the, the, to the uh, industrial plant and it works. 10 years later, nowadays we are talking about a lot of security deficiencies there. And I'm seeing exactly the same things here, especially because we are adopting EEG more and more. I'll, I'll show you later. So I think, honestly, I think that this is the, the best moment to, to put security in these technologies, to think with security in mind to implement better security controls in there. And of course, uh, brain stuff is cool, like in cyberpunk literature, in, in, in movies, you know, all we see in movies, so this is something that inspires me, you know, like play a little bit with, with the brain, especially in recent movies. For that, what I did, all, all, I, all I knew was that there is some technology 
measuring on our brain waves. So I started to learn a little bit of neuroscience. So for me, to you, this is Neuroscience 101. It's very basic. It's just five minutes from here. In our brain, we have different lobes. We have the cortex, different uh, parts of our brain. And in the brain, there are um, millions of these excitable cells, the neurons that, that we know. They share information between each other. So this information that they share is basically uh, electrical and uh, chemical signals. It's a process for do many different things, to sleep, to move, to move this finger, to give a presentation, a book on, you know, many things. And depending on your, your mind state, the synapse activity uh, could be affected. For example, from a normal behavior, or if you are on caffeine or any other drug, this activity behaves differently, right? So this is after one month or something, I learned that the human brain is very complex. If you go to Google, you will find like thousands and thousands of documents and presentations and like a lot of stuff that you will get impressed, seriously. Um, now, moving on. To understand these technologies, there is a very big separation. Invasive technologies and non-invasive technologies. As you can see in the graph, invasive technologies means implanting a chip in the cortex, like this. So you are, you are getting the synapse activity in a, in a more clear way, easier, it's more reliable. But on the other hand, if you put a scalp, uh, sorry, uh, an electrode on your scalp, this is a non-invasive method, it's prone to, it's prone to um, noise because of the school, but it's an easiest way. Uh, this is a very clear example of an invasive brain-computer interface. Basically, these researchers implementing the, the electrode, getting the synapse activity, so all you have to do is to think, like thinking, I want to move this arm. Evidently, there is a lot of research behind and training behind to this, but it works. So there is a, this is a, a famous project, BrainGate, uh, of this woman using this brain-computer interface, controlling this uh, mechanical arm. On the other hand, and the purpose of this talk is to talk about non-invasive. And with non-invasive, the most used one, the most famous one is EEG, electroencephalography. Basically, our electrodes on your scalp, on your scalp, and it looks like this. It's the representation over time of these connections between your, your neurons. So you can see different spikes, different, uh, and it has different meanings, of course, but basically this is it. It's a representation of, of your brain activity. Uh, it's very easy to use. All you have to do is to put um, electrodes on your brain. Uh, it's susceptible to noise. I really like this quote by this famous neuroscientist, John Donog, Donoghue, I don't know how to <laughs> say his name, sorry. Uh, the current brain technologies are like trying to listen to a conversation in a football stadium from a blimp. You know, these globes flying. So this is the best analogy I've heard now because there is a lot of noise to get information from your brain to pass through the school. It's, 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 it's very hard, but still, it works. Uh, okay, the activity is very small. It's measured in microvolts, and the main frequencies are also between one and, and 30 hertz. And every, every, um, every wavelength have uh, different meanings. For example, when you are awake and putting attention to where you are focused, your beta waves are higher than when you're sleeping. Uh, there are different methods to put the skull, the, the electrodes, because I, as I told you before, uh, different regions from the brain has different uh, objectives. So the signals are analog. In order to send them to a computer for processing or storage, there is a digital conversion. There are amplifiers in between, filters, etc. Sampling stuff. So this is a real EEG recording. Every line is an electrode. And what the researchers or the doctors see here, they find different uh, patterns. They have different artifacts. An artifact is an event that is not related 
by the, uh, directly to the brain. For example, an artifact would be the sweating between uh, my body and the electrode, or could be uh, me blinking my eyes, blinking my eyes. This could affect the brain activity, but it's not uh, strictly related. Uh, I got this book, which is basically an atlas of EEG patterns. why it takes years for, for uh, neuroscientists to understand these patterns. So now, how do we get this information? There is paid hardware, commercial hardware, which is very expensive, even thousands of dollar, dollars, and there are some consumer devices, which are these ones. NeuroSky, MindWave, it I just got this one for 100 bucks on Amazon.com. And this is the purpose of this talk. Now it's easy to get these devices and create some stuff, uh, stuff to create some research to do different applications. Or on the other hand, you can do it yourself, open source software and hardware. Now, in the following slides, I want you to put attention. I want, I want you to put to be like a, like a malicious attacker. Think in all the uses uh, in the following slides and think all the different attack scenarios, that the attack vectors that you might, you might find. Uh, for example, um, this is the most used uh, use of EEG, clinical use. It's for um, installing different disorders like seizures, sleeping disorders, uh, people with narcolepsy, etc. I will show you quickly So this is a real software used in a hospital. As you can see, this is basically data. This is the patient. And the video is synchronized with the EEG recordings. You can see his brain activity. He's going from normal. He's having a seizure now. These green things there are annotations by the doctors to understand what's happening exactly at what point he's having a seizure exactly, what brain waves were going bad, right? This is what's happening in hospitals right now. There are recordings in digital format, scope, etc. So this is the, the research, the clinical use. Now, there is people using this data and putting it to the cloud to analyze them, to apply a, a complex algorithm to better understand different, um, different diseases, right? Uh, there is people playing with Arduino, with some other electronic boards to use these EEG devices to control any mechanical processes, like this mechanical ankle or like this... Um, a hand with an Arduino, Arduino board, or brain-to-brain -brain interface. It used to be like science fiction five years ago, or 10 years ago, but now in the University of Washington, they are doing really cool stuff with brain-to-brain -brain, um, research. So basically, there is one guy in one side of the world using an EEG device. They are getting his brain waves. They are passing it through a computer and the computer process it, decodes it and send it over the internet. On the other end, there is another computer receiving this information, encoding it and sending it to TMS. TMS stands for Transcranial Magnetic Stimulator. It's a very uh, complex device that basically uh, uh, stimulates certain parts of your brain to do something. So the experiment basically was this. 
this guy was just thinking about pressing his, uh, his finger, just thinking. This information went to the internet and he received it here with this TMS thing and unconsciously he just pressed the, the button. So basically it's a brain-to-brain -brain interface. And they are doing it for many different purposes. Um, I read on, I don't remember in BBC or New York Times, that it could help in hypothetical examples. For, uh, let's say that the pilot and the copilot died in a flight. So this technology in a very long future, I don't know where, when, there could be a Hamlet that one of the flight attendants could use. So from the ground, she would be controlled by somewhere else, by brainwave. Sounds crazy, right? But there's people doing it now. Uh, controlling stuff with brain waves. Uh, there is a drone being controlled in, in, in Lisbon now, in Portugal. Uh, controlling helicopters. We know passwords, words that we know, secrets. What about using past thoughts? Your brain waves as a biometric mechanism, right? It's, there is people working now in Harvard. Uh, all the URLs, you can find all the my, my sources here. Um, in military use, soldiers converting brain waves into commands, or there are, these neuroscientists are using, uh, I, are passing a lot of pictures to the soldiers in order, in order to identify threatening scenarios. So the soldiers are just thinking, and they might think, oh, perhaps behind that rock, there is a bomb or there is a, a gunman, I don't know. So all this information, encoding in brain waves, are being used for further uh, research in the battle, for neurofeedback, for art, um, creating music, or this case, this is a murderer, and his case was taken to the, to the trial. So his lawyer said, hey, I need a, a brain scan of this guy. So in the end, the EEG result, could affect the trial. I don't know. It could affect the number of years in prison or have, I don't know. Neurogaming, playing video games just with brain waves, neuromarketing, and neuroware. I saw this one in DEF CON. There was a girl using one of these uh, uh, ears. So basically, it's a headset, this, this, this thing, scanning your brain waves and according to your to your um, focusing level or relaxed level, your ears move or your tail moves, and it's connected to geolocation. If you are angry, if you are sad, they tag your, geo, your geolocation based on brain waves. And this is, this company is having good success. Now, NeuroWare. Tinder, but with EEG data. Basically, matching people with EEG brainwaves. I had a chance to talk with this guy, the, the, the CEO, the creator. We had a quick conversation on, um, on him over email, a quick interview. And the algorithms that they are using to do the matching stuff are like amazing. A lot of, lot of interesting stuff. Surfers in Mexico using their brainwaves for research. Uh, these companies using your data to the cloud for research purposes as well. So you've seen it. It's being adopted everywhere in many uses, military use, research, blah, blah, blah. But this is what, we're, what I want to talk uh, about now, the security aspects, the security, the, uh, the attack scenarios. What can you do if you can sniff some brain data in the wire, you can do replay attacks. For example, if you were able to intercept the traffic from the computer controlling a drone, and if there is no security mechanisms in between, you can save a copy to your computer, and later on you can send this same data to the drone or to the prosthesis, or I don't know. It's just an idea, right? This is just conceptual now. Um, or if you are in the network of a hospital and the server receiving the brain waves, let's say that there is a patient, a criminal, and there is a higher top secret attacker inside the hospital network, he can uh, update his record unauthorized. Let's say that the brain activity was 
uh, resulted in a normal behavior? What if this guy go and update this information with really wrong data? Like, I don't know, having um, schizophrenia. I don't know. What about instead of trading hundreds or thousands of email for spamming purposes, purposes um, trading EG data for neuromarketing? There are different attack scenarios that I see here. As I told you before, it's hard to achieve. Why? Basically because you need to understand the environment. It's not very easy to say like, yeah, I'm gonna capture this packet and I'm going to reply this back later to move the car to the right. You need to understand all the environment, the technologies behind, to understand uh, what products are being in use, the file formats, the protocols, what byte to move in what, in what extent. It's very hard to, 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 to understand it. this. And special expertise is required. And with a special expertise, I mean electroencephalography. Uh, however, it's feasible. And I'm showing you some demonstrations. Now, this is from here to the past is just the introductory stuff. From here is what I saw for the last one year, my research. I found that most of the products, uh, sorry, I found that just a few products of them, they mentioned the security wars, they mentioned that they implement authentication, they mentioned uh, that they encrypt the data. Like, for example, these guys from Neuromore, they are sending the data through an SSL channel, which, you know, at least this is not uh, in, clear, in, in clear text. However, I didn't find the classic security keywords that we look for in, in, in technical specifications, like crypto, authentication, security, passwords, in 90% of the manuals that I, that, I, uh, that I checked. And I spent weeks doing this. Um, the funny thing and the interesting thing is when you use TCP IP as your communication protocol, by design, TCP IP doesn't include any security mechanism, right? And if you put your data on it, your application layer uh, number seven on it, without authentication or encryption or whatever, it's the same, it's still vulnerable. And I'm going to show you. If you go to Google and look for some products for neuro acquisition, TCP port, you will find many different products for, for, for this. Um, for example, this product, Brain Vision uh, Rig Viewer. Real-time analysis uh, received over the network via TCP directly from the recorder. Or these guys uh, obtaining brain waves uh, from the, in the Himalayas and sending it to the software where it can be visible on every PC on the network. Or these other guys, Neuroelectric, Sneak, that say, the software can be remotely commanded. Uh, listen on this TCP port, one, two, three, five, for incoming connections, and you can start the streaming, stop the streaming, and start and stop the stimulation. And we have another example here. All this information was taken from the brochures, from the technical specifications, right? Uh, once the date is ready, you just connect to the port, and you will get the data streaming in this format. Channel one, channel n, every channel is one electrode in your scalp, and the bytes, the four bytes for, for, for this information. There are some libraries, software libraries that are being used more and more nowadays in these research projects, uh, like this one, LSL, is being supported in different uh, uh, programming languages, but still the same. I went through these libraries very quickly to check the, the the sending and receiving routines of brain data and just are sending the data in, in binary format. So no encryption, no security in there. Demonstration. In the following demonstration, I'm, I'm going to use a neuro server. Basically, it's a server, it's a trans saver using TCP IP and EDF format that I will explain later. Um, this is very old, it's not maintained, but it's still in use for research purposes. And it's included in Brain Bay, which is, Brain, uh, Bay is an, uh, it's a more recent software 
but still using this old code. And it's full of vulnerabilities, it's full of uh, flaws. I will show you. What I'm going to do in the next demo, um, I'm going to sniff my brain signals doing a classic man in the middle attack. Man in the middle means one computer, there is another computing, a computer sending information. There is an attacker in between that can poison the ARP tables so he can get a copy, he can intercept the data, right? Um, so just remember this data. So the acquisition device is NeuroSky, this one that I showed you. It will be connected to the Windows computer and this will be sending my brain waves to the EEG server. This is a virtual machine, it's a computer named Daria, right? Okay, so um, here we have this software, Brainwave, uh, Brain Bay. This is in the local computer, in the Windows. Uh, I just connected to the COM port 5, it's connected already. It's synchronized to Bluetooth, so my brain waves are going now here in Bluetooth. Now, uh, this device, MindWave, will connect to this oscilloscope, which is this one, just to vis visualize the, the signals, but it will be sending a copy to a TCP sender. And the TCP sender will be sending this data to NeuroServer. It's a basic uh, diamond. It's listening for connections. Okay, so in between there will be an attacker in this computer. So this is the attacker. He already infected the, the, the both computers, but as you know, TCP IP doesn't show any warning, it's just transparent. All you can do is see the ARP table. You can see that the MAC address, the physical address is pointing to two different IPs. This is bad, this is an attack. 
both here, the diamond is still working, and I'm going to start the session. You can see these are my real-time brain waves. Sometimes I'm, at least I have, I have some, some, some waves. I'm still working. So, I will send a copy to the neuro server remotely over TCP IP. This is the IP address. This is the patient name, Alejandro, the device. This is the server. Connect. Got connection from the client. And I will start sending. So, now it's sending thousands of packets, of EEG packets, and we can see it here in the server. Neuro server received this connection, this header, from Alejandro using NeuroSky My Wave, and it's receiving thousands of packets. But, the attacker is having a copy. This is the attacker, the malicious user on the network. He's receiving my brain waves now, a copy of them. This is basically what happens, what would happen if there is no encryption in between, right, of the brain waves. These values are encoded in a specific format of neural server. Every technology has their own specific formats. You need to know how to decode it. But I will talk about later about protocols and file formats. So this is what happens when there is no um, encryption. Now, what about the unrest? How do we know how they are protect, uh, protecting our brain uh, data on the cloud? We don't know yet. We, there should be some assessments, some regulations in between. Now, if we talk about authentication, what is authentication? In just a few words, it's the process of determining whether someone or something is who or what it is declared to be. So there should be authentication mechanisms between these things, these devices, and the other ends. For example, the middleware in between the device and the EEG server, and the EEG server and the drone, or the car, or the prosthesis. There should be something that the prosthesis, or whatever it is, says like, hey, I'm receiving EEG data. I'm receiving valid brain waves. Is this supposed, are, are they coming from the trusted source? This is basically authentication. There should be something in between. And, in this product, Nick, is the same. There is no authentication receiving data. And I'm going to show you another demo with the same uh, scenario. But in this case, I will not only be sniffing. The man in the middle attack will be catching the information and will be replacing some of this data. In this demo, from this device, I will send the patient name Alejandro to the, to the EEG server. For demonstration purposes only, I will change only my ASCII data, Alejandro, the ASCII, the, the characters. But it could be any single byte from the, from the streaming. It could be the brain waves itself. It could be any byte in the, in the, in the whole uh, stream, right? So I will be the attacker again in the same computer. And let's say. Okay. 
We have the server listening. We have the client in another computer reading my brain waves. I'm going to send the brain waves to the server in the hospital, let's say that is in a different apartment or whatever, or in the other side of the world through the internet, same thing. The patient name, Alejandro. I will connect to the server, yeah, we got connection. And I will start sending. So now, it is sending my brain waves to the server over TCP IP, but what the server received, the server received in the demonstration changed from Alejandro to John Connor, the same for demo. It could be the brain waves itself, it could be any, any data itself. So this is the problem of not having authentication, right? What about resilience? Resilience basically is the ability to support or recover from adversity. In this case, we are calling adversity denial of service attacks. Uh, I was very surprised when I saw that 90s technique were still killing 21st century technologies. I just created this basic C code, like 10,000 connections to see what, 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 what would happen if you connect, you create many sockets to these servers. And guess what? Yeah, the servers crashed, some of them. So a brainwave server, as it, uh, the name says, is just a server. The different clients, clients could be a monitor uh, showing the, the brainwaves in real time in a hospital, or it could be the doctor uh, walking on the halls um, with, the, with an iPad monitoring the, the, the stuff in real time connecting to the server. And I will show you a vulnerability that I found in this software, the Open Vibe. The Open Vibe is software for uh, brain computer interfaces and real time neurosciences. So basically, there is a remote denial of service uh, vulnerability here. I'll show you. I don't know, sadly something uh, happened in between. I don't want to lose time. So I have the demonstration here. It's recorded. It is the same software. It's open vibe. Basically, I'm configuring my communication port here. It's connecting. I connect to the driver in the Windows machine. I reproduce, I get the data, the brain waves. I open the designer to display the brain waves. And this is basically a dis uh, display. You are seeing my brain waves there, which are, would be in real time, the electrode up there. And imagine this is in a hospital in real time, in a critical situation of a patient or something. And there, uh, there comes the attacker sending 1,000 connections to the TCP port.
So you will see thousands or even hundreds of, of, of uh, connections, and suddenly it stops. The server dies, so no other client would be able to connect to the server because it's already crashed, and yeah, it died, it closed. So this technology is, um, in my opinion, is like SCADA networks, like industrial networks, like eight years ago. You used to send an NMAP scan or just a basic scan, and the PLCs, the, the, the industrial components, died. I think this is exactly the same here. Uh, I found another vulnerability, the same thing in this product, Neuroelectrics, NIC. So in this product, this is a basic C code to create many sockets. So you have the software here, the scalp, the electrodes and everything. And after a while, no more connections, no more connections. Trying to connect manually, connection refused. And yes, the application is, is, is just hang. It, it died. And there are many, many, many flaws. Uh, for the next one, I took uh, this file format, EDF, is a specification, it's a uh, international file format to encode your brain waves, your brain signals. And if you create a malformed header and you send it to a neuro server, you can crash it. I will show you, this is a demo. I, public, I published uh, this proof of concept code on ExploitDB, it's very easy, you can, you can play in between, I'll show you. So this is the code. Basically, it's a malformed header sent, being sent to a socket. Okay. Neuro server, remote denial of service, connected to the port, entered in GEG role, sending malformed header, and neuro server should be dead now. And yes, the server which is, should be alive is just crashed. This is a, a beautiful assertion there, just core dumped. And like this, there are so many of them, so many. I found. A, like this one. This is basically um, an array of client structures, 16 max clients. But every time there is a new connection, there is no validation of this counter. They are just counting more and more and more. And after they, are, they, they have the index, they are referencing this index here through Memset. They are putting this uh, uh, memory area to zero. So basically it's an invalid memory uh, the reference, And that means that if you create a lot of sockets, you will get a beautiful uh, 6F segmentation fault. And you can see the memory that was trying to put to zero and blah, blah, blah. And I will touch this topic very quickly. I only have 10 minutes. The Tower of Babel of EEG file formats. The doctors, the physicians, when they share information about the, their patients, they, are, they share this information in file formats. How are our brain waves encoded in these file formats? I would say that this like in any, any other file format, JPG, PDF, whatever. In the end, is the data and the metadata to understand this information, right? So um, the problem here is there are so many proprietary file formats. Every vendor is creating their own file format, their own technology, their own uh, interpretation there. And this is a problem because in the old times there was a problem, a compatibility problem between hospitals and doctors, right? 
Uh, this is why in 92 and 2003, they created EDF, like a standard uh, file format. Uh, so it took me weeks, again, to go through brochures, manuals, specifications to create this table. What I did, I looked on the internet, the vendor name, the product name, software or hardware, and I put different columns of the supported file format, and in the end resulted that most of them have their own proprietary file format and EDF. So I decided to play a little bit with EDF. Uh, EDF is just, as I said, a bunch of bytes. And as a bunch of bytes, they are parsing. And in parsing, you will find the same problems as are parsing any other kind of stuff. You will find buffer overflows, memory corruption, arithmetic calculations. Um, but this is a very uh, unexplored file format. You know, the, the attack scenarios here, the attack, um, the attack surface is very reduced. It's a very specialized file, for file format. The bad guys are not going to, uh, to exploit buffer overflows and this kind of stuff because only the physicians or the neuroscientists, they have this kind of software. But still, it's just for fun. If you are learning exploitation and buffer overflows and fuzzing, you can play a little bit with this software and you will find a lot of information here. Um, they're using insecure functions. So, to save time, I did trivial fuzzing, just basically file format fuzzing using the fuzzer of a friend, of a coworker, mangle.c. Uh, the samples, the test cases, I used my own brain signals uh, saved in an EDF format, and I downloaded some of them from some others from Fisionet. Fisionet is a, a database of psychological signals, so you can download there and open in your viewer, in your browser, and you, you can corrupt these files to open later in your, in your applications, right? So in the end, I, this is my fuzzing uh, uh, journal. I create, these are my, my test cases, the, fuzz, the fuzzer that I used, how many bytes specifically selected from the header, uh, the percentage, uh, how many test cases, and it was very easy to find, you know, like many bugs in different software. I don't have time to show you some, some demos, but I found some flaws in this commercial, uh, this is commercial, the other ones are uh, open source software, but are like uh, kind of famous in hospitals and physicians. Uh, you can find uh, many software vulnerabilities and errors there. And there are some other interesting as uh, aspects, like my brain waves were going back and forth, uh, sorry, from here to the computer. Uh, on Bluetooth, right? There are some other, other options that use Wi-Fi. What about putting, you know, like some jammers in a hospital? What about putting a jammer between the car and the drone being controlled by the brain waves? You know, these this kind of things are uh, interesting. Um, I went to Shodan and I found that there is people saving brain waves in, in share folders with the, with the names. They are password protected, but still, they are using them for, for, uh, for storing brain waves. Children on remote desktop. I found this whole solution, which, were, which was implemented in three computers, a database computer, a monitor uh, station, and yes, they are accessible through the internet of things. I would say like internet of <laughs> brain waves or whatever. And yeah, supported by the beautiful Windows XP. There is a lot of security uh, research uh, still uh, being done nowadays about uh, brainwave stuff. Um, we need to talk more about privacy, who is in charge of it, guidelines. I went to this website, American Clinical Neurophysiology Society, and I found guidelines, recommended best practices and stuff. And they are kind of old. In one of them is guidelines for recording clinical EEG on digital media. Yeah, to use magnetic, ma magnetic storage and CD rooms and stuff like that. This, it's very old. So conclusions, we need to put more security when we, des when we design these products. If you are a researcher and you're using these EEG uh, technologies, think in security as well. If you are controlling some critical stuff there, 
and the technology is not supporting security itself, you can put some uh, workarounds like SSL tunnels in between. So you can avoid some of this uh, um, sniffing stuff. We need more secure programming. We need more file format standardization. Uh, if you like to play, as I told you before, with security vulnerabilities and fuzzing and stuff, you, you have a new terrain to play in uh, with networking and, and applications. Um, try your, test your medical devices and software, force them, do some uh, security checks. Uh, for further research, for those who want to scan the internet with ZMAP, for those who have uh, a good bandwidth and time uh, to play with, I'm pretty sure there are uh, many devices connected there in the internet. All you need is time and a good uh, bandwidth. And you know, a set of specific IP addresses, like research centers or universities, I don't know what to find. And yes, perhaps in the future, like nowadays, nowadays I've seen uh, appliances for industrial networks. There are deep packet inspectors for the, the layer seven. For example, they go inside the, the network packets to tell you, hey, this Modbus packet is corrupted. This Modbus TCP packet is malicious. I think in the future there could be some things like this in hospitals, like for, like let's say a biosignals firewall. Nowadays there is there is there are firewall, firewalls implementing uh, DPI in 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 SCADA networks. Why not for biosignals in the future for this kind of file formats for this kind of protocols? We don't know. Well, thank you. If you have any questions or something, uh, you can ask me in the party with a beer in the hand and we can just discuss. And thank you so much. I hope you have uh, liked it. <laughs> but if there is any question now from Hi, thanks for the uh, presentation. Did you submit the bugs to vendors and how did they react? Yes. Um, it was cool, actually. Um, the guys from, uh, there is a company based in Barcelona. I sent uh, an email to them, but they never replied after, I don't know, uh, well, they replied after two weeks or something. I told them, hey, I found some issues in your product. This is the way how you should fix it. But they reply uh, two weeks later in the proper way. Like, oh, thank you so much for reporting these issues for uh, uh, to us. We're going to patch it later. But what I feel is that these, the, these companies are not aware of the security things, are not aware of the of the vulnerability disclosure programs and stuff like that. So I'm pretty sure that internally in the company, there were like, hey, wait, there is a guy who will present a vulnerability of us in, in Las Vegas or something. What, what do we do now? What, what's happening now? But these guys specifically, uh, they acted well. From the other products, I just send the, um, the exploits, the proof of concept codes to the internet because it's very easy to patch. It's open source software, so it's, it's easy to patch. And yeah, the commercial products, I would say that was the only one. Any other question? All right, thank you, Alejandro. Very nice. Thank you.